Bienvenue à tous pour cette neuvième séance du SOCOSMA, le séminaire d'observation de la crise COVID-19 dans les sociétés du monde arabe. Welcome to all for this ninth edition of SOCOSMA, a webinar observing the COVID-19 crisis's repercussions on the societies of the Arab world. Ahlan bikum fil khalqa tasa'a li webinar سوكوسما سيمينار خاص بتداعيات أزمة الكوفيد في مجتمعات العالم العربي. This is the ninth edition and ten months of massive presence of the virus in our daily lives on a global scale. Socosma is a webinar organized by the French network of research centers in humanities based in the Arab world and aims at producing knowledge and showcasing research on this total event. SOCOSMA was created at the initiative of CIFRIPA, formerly known as CIFAS, a center specializing in the Arabian Peninsula and based in Kuwait City with antennas in Muscat and Abu Dhabi. It gathered Centre Jacques Berg in Rabat, Morocco, IRMC in Tunis, Sedej in Cairo, Sedej Khartoum, and IFPO in Beirut and Amman. This session brings us back a third time to the Arabian Peninsula with two guest speakers who will discuss religious discourse in the face of Corona in the Arabian Peninsula, Abdesalam Rubaidi from Yemen and Laurent Bonfoy from Masqat, Oman. This webinar will be recorded and placed on the Sokosma YouTube channel. In order to ask questions, please use the dedicated Zoom conversation window and your microphones will be opened by order of inscription. And I will now leave Philippe Petria to present our guests for today's session. Philippe, you're it. Thank you, Frédéric. Thank you, Laurent, and Dick Abdel Salam. I'm quite excited to, to introduce our two speakers today in the name of the CEFREPA, which is the new name of the CEFAS, the Centre Français de Recherche pour la Péninsule Arabie. Laurent Bonnefoy is a specialist of human history and human politics. He is now a researcher in NASCAT uh, for the CEFREPA, the, 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 the CEFAS. And uh, with uh, Abdel Salam al Zaidi, who is a lecturer uh, at uh, the University of uh, Al Jaida uh, in Yemen, they have some shared um, interest in political and uh, religious discourses in Yemen, uh, focusing on Yemen and uh, on the Arabian Peninsula more uh, broadly. So I leave them the floor, and I'm quite excited to welcome them in the name of the CEFAS for this uh, thrilling uh, topic today of uh, religious discourse in the time of uh, COVID-19. Thank you. Well, uh, thank you very much. It's, uh, it's a pleasure to actually share the floor with my, uh, my dear friend, uh, Abdel Salam. We've, uh, we've had uh, numerous opportunities over the years to work together, and I'm really happy to, to uh, uh, establish uh, a new uh, bond uh, through uh, Zoom and through this seminar with him between Muscat and, uh, and Sana'a. So the purpose of my, uh, my talk um, is to give a, a kind of broad overview of uh, the kind of discourse which has emerged over the last uh, year or so uh, amongst uh, religious actors at large uh, in uh, the seven uh, countries of the Arabian Peninsula. It so happens by uh, that uh, for long, uh, these actors uh, appeared to be central. They were central objects in a number of uh, publications of researchers uh, focusing on uh, the peninsula. Uh, over the last, uh, so to speak, three decades, um, the number of publications which focused on uh, either uh, religious actors per se or Islamist ones, uh, which are a segment of religious actors which uh, uh, can be defined as ones who willingly um, resort to religious discourse to uh, justify their political stances. Well, these, uh, these two uh, segments were at the core of many uh, publications. And yet what's, uh, what's rather puzzling is that uh, uh, basically ever since uh, the fall 
of, uh, of Daesh. So over the last uh, three or four years, we could say that uh, they have lost their centrality, at least in uh, the publications, at least in discourses or in, uh, in seminars like the ones we are, we are holding. Um, and uh, um, this is, uh, this uh, I consider is, is rather puzzling and should uh, encourage us to, to sort of understand uh, why. It's quite clear that it's been, uh, it's been the case in, uh, in Yemen, um, where um, publications dealing with, uh, with uh, Islamist parties, for instance, have sort of, uh, sort of disappeared. Um, it's also the case, I would say, in, in Saudi Arabia, where you have a new, uh, new issues linked to identity, culture, youth, which are quite clearly uh, emerging within uh, social sciences dealing with uh, contemporary issues. Um, so the comparatively uh, lower interest for uh, these, uh, these religious actors does not mean that there is uh, necessarily a change in the, in the role that they play. It's just that there has been a change in the, in the way they are constructed as an object by, uh, by researchers. Um, <clears throat> what I want to, uh, to, to state here over the course of, uh, of this, uh, this short presentation is that uh, um, the pandemic is uh, in itself an interesting moment to actually assess and understand what has been changing in the relationship between uh, religious actors and, and the state. I'm sorry, I... had forgotten to share the... Uh, the PowerPoint. Um, so the the fact that there might be a decreasing uh, academic interest for religion in the Arabian Peninsula is uh, is a point that uh, that I want to uh, to make and that I consider is uh, is is rather relevant. And yet it does not mean that uh, that the power or the the role of religion in itself has uh, has changed. Um, and yet. Much like elsewhere across the globe, or uh, or also in the in the, in the Arab world, as other uh, sessions of Soposma have shown, uh, the pandemic has profoundly transformed societies and institutions in the in the region. As uh, Mehdi uh, Ayashi had uh, had highlighted during our first session on Oman, um, the, sh the the institutions, public institutions, and particularly uh, the state and the government, have projected themselves as a uh, um, shaped as having their policies shaped by science and technicity. And so they pushed forward a different kind of uh, vocabulary, different forms of institutions, and also new forms of services which are rendered to the, um, to the citizens and expatriates by uh, the, uh, the public institution. Quite tellingly, uh, this new discourse has led to uh, what can be labeled a relegation of religious discourses. Of course, one could state that this is, not, uh, this is nothing really new and that over the last few years, uh, such a trend has been, uh, has been uh, uh, noticeable, uh, for instance, in Saudi Arabia, where you have multiple examples of a kind of relegation of a number of, uh, of institutions. One of them being the, uh, the so-called uh, mutawa or the, the religious police, which the, uh, which the government and the rulers have tried to uh, uh, set, set aside. And yet the urgency of the pandemic pushed forward such a, such a trend in a very uh, uh, way in a, in a number of instances. Um, I would state that, for instance, the approval by religious authorities of the vaccines has, uh, has dragged rather tremendously. Um, for instance, uh, the UAE um, received an approval by, uh, by the, the, the official body um, that issues, uh, issues fatwa, while it had already uh, vaccinated a million and a half uh, of its uh, inhabitants which is rather, uh, rather significant of a new kind of hierarchy, which is uh, manifest in public, public discourses. The same thing goes for Saudi Arabia, where you had the Grand Mufti 
um, who uh, declared that vaccines were a blessing, a ni'ma from God, uh, more than two weeks after Mohammed bin Salman, whom you see on the picture, which I, show, which I used uh, for, the, for, the, um, for the PowerPoint, uh, received his own, uh, his own vaccine. And these timelines, I think, are, are rather, rather telling. In a similar way, uh, the closure of mosques, um, with a notable exception of, of Yemen and, and Abdus Salam, will, will probably have the opportunity to to, to uh, actually stress the reasons why it's an exception, but the, the closure of mosques, which uh, happened very early on in the process, uh, often in, uh, in mid-March, if not in late February, for in certain, uh, um, under certain, uh, certain conditions in, uh, in Saudi Arabia, well, this did not um, uh, trigger any kind of massive resistance on the part of religious uh, actors. And it actually showed that, um, quite tellingly, religion was no longer considered something as uh, strictly essential. Or it, were, it became, at least when it was practiced collectively, a kind of uh, social, uh, social issue and a problem. As uh, Frédéric Lagrange had mention, mentioned uh, during his, uh, his talk a few months back on popular culture and on production uh, on the internet, it was rather telling that uh, uh, for the first time in, in history, uh, there was a kind of inversion where collective uh, prayer, collective practice of religion in itself was a prerequisite to stopping, uh, stopping the virus. It was no longer uh, something which in itself could uh, be considered as uh, something positive. It was by the major majority of uh, actors seen as uh, uh, something which was uh, uh, problematic and it, in itself, I would say this is uh, this is rather counterintuitive, and uh, and interesting. Evidently, like I said earlier, there's no reason to actually uh, consider that um, these uh, these new discourses and new concerns in public uh, policies uh, have actually uh, led to the marginalization of uh, of piety. Um, piety itself was never uh, at stake in any any kind of uh, discourses, and you can see in uh, in different formulations, in different uh, um, statements, either made in the media or the social media, uh, which emphasized the the link between uh, being a good uh, Muslim or a good uh, uh, worshipper and uh, and health. What's uh, interesting, uh, apart from these uh, these uh, um, broad uh, broad statements, is that um, um, using my uh, my own position as a, as a social scientist, um, we can try to define uh, three different ideal types which have emerged over the last uh, last months, and which I, I see uh, as as rather telling of a number of uh, of dynamics which are uh, which are at play. Um, these, uh, these dynamics um, invite us in a way to go also beyond uh, what is probably the first impression when we are dealing with, uh, with religious discourse in, uh, in the Arabian Peninsula, and that is to consider that public institutions have such a grasp over so so social society that they are in the capacity to actually control all the discourses which, uh, which emerge. Obviously, the first, uh, the first ideal uh, type is uh, the most massive. It is the one which emerged uh, in defense and in support of uh, health-oriented public policies across, uh, across the board. Um, and this uh, highlights what can be considered as a rather impressive capacity uh, by the state to control what is the actual output uh, of uh, religious uh, discourse. As uh, Badr has safe, uh, a researcher uh, who has worked on uh, the discourse in Saudi Arabia has highlighted, he states that uh, this uh, pandemic has created what he calls a subordinate role for religious actors. Um, so examples of, uh, of uh, fatawa uh, which uh, support and endorse uh, the policies which are health oriented uh, and the decision making of the of the government are rather rather numerous. Um, 
And this even came from, uh, from actors which uh, had a strictly religious orientation. Um, one of them has been the which is the, uh, the religious body of the, uh, of the religious police in Saudi Arabia, which launched a, a new campaign um, to uh, support using religious vocabulary the fact that one should stay at home. Um, and this has been considered, uh, including by, uh, by Badr al-Saif, as something which, is, which was rather telling of a, a new kind of, uh, kind of role. At the same time, you had a, a number of debates uh, which which emerged and which were, were rather telling of the new orientations. Um, one of them being the the um, the, di the discussions regarding the fact that were the dead to be considered martyrs or not. Um, there was a, a, a fatwa which was issued outside of the peninsula, which which received a, a support within, um, which considered that health workers, if they were dying as a, uh, in the course of their uh, their activity um, of COVID should be considered as martyrs. And then you had uh, Salafi uh, uh, discussions, uh, which kind of tried to broaden this, uh, this, uh, this perception and, and considered that uh, under certain circumstances, uh, there could be uh, uh, such a kind of, uh, of labeling. Another um, issue uh, which uh, um, sort of structured uh, the discourse uh, in, within the peninsula has been um, the closure of mosques and the change of the of the adhan, so the, the call to prayer. Um, this has been um, made uh, quite systematic. The change of adhan uh, from early March, from uh, from mid March, sorry, in uh, in Kuwait and Saudi Arabia, and you had a change in the uh, in the formulation. So. Um, so come to come to prayer has been has been changed uh, uh, through different uh, different formulations. I'm not sure that it's actually visible on the on the PowerPoint, but uh, but there was uh, uh, also a debate as to what kind of labeling should be used. Was it uh, to be a, a salafi boyuticum, so in your home, or could there be a kind of a formulation which was more uh, more religiously loaded, which would be theorihalikum? Uh, and there, well, when it was used, Fiori uh, Halkom, uh, so in your place, um, uh, there was uh, explanations in uh, numerous videos which were, uh, which were published as what it actually, uh, what it actually uh, entailed. Uh, another um, uh, interesting uh, moment was during Ramadan and the issue of whether it was actually uh, permissible to, uh, to pray at home or whether it, were, it, sh it should be considered as a kind of obligation. So uh, during the time across across the countries, you had um, um, discourses which um, were issued by uh, legitimate authorities. And so the example that I took is the one from the from the Mufti of Saudi Arabia, which considered that uh, that it was actually um, allowed to go and, and pray at home for the for the Eid prayer. What's interesting is that uh, at, at no uh, during that time, while endorsing the, uh, the, 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 the idea that it should not be a collective prayer, uh, they never really used uh, any kind of religiously loaded uh, vocabulary. So it was never yajuz uh, um, or la yajuz or haram, which are the, the usual uh, um, keywords which are used in fatawa to actually legitimize uh, something. But it was in a way a kind of a secular or secularization uh, discourse which, uh, which emerged. Uh, the same goes uh, for uh, the Mufti of Oman, and we'll get back to his, uh, his uh, stances uh, later, um, who, uh, who, who published uh, um, a kind of endorsement, which would be a civil endorsement of uh, uh, the positions which were defended by the, uh, by the authorities. Uh, by claiming that that any uh, people should uh, abide to the rules which were addicted by the Supreme, uh, Supreme Committee. And uh, the second ideal type uh, considers uh, that um, a religious discourse could be uh, mobilized to develop a very different form of, uh, of position regarding the pandemic. 
the uh, religious discourse could become a way to uh, criticize uh, either science in itself or the West and consider that uh, the pandemic should be seen as a godly response to a number of, uh, of sins or, and when I'm saying that would be critical of science, would consider that it was actually a creation by the West for different, uh, different, uh, with different objectives, one of them being uh, uh, reducing fertility rates of, of Muslims. So Abdel Salam will have the opportunity, I think, to uh, focus more on, the, on this type of uh, discourse. The reason being that uh, it, it is much more present, I think, in, in Yemen, in particular because uh, the public authorities in Yemen, uh, especially in the north of Yemen, uh, have a different kind of stance than the ones um, which are in the uh, monarchies. Um, the authorities in, uh, in Sana'a, um, in a way, do not abide by the rules of the international system, and they consider that uh, the pandemic could be an opportunity to actually value a different kind of, uh, of discourse. And yet, when you're looking at uh, what could be seen as a radical uh, critique or the, the use of religious discourse by a number of, uh, so to speak, uh, radical actors, um, I mean, blunt conspiracy theories were rather rare. Um, and this is also uh, quite telling. It's also quite telling that um, there was a near absence of uh, millennialistic discourses. And this is a far uh, a move from uh, what was dominant, for instance, regarding, regarding Syria uh, only five, uh, five years ago. Um, and so uh, when you're looking at discourses which were issued by, uh, by uh, Daesh, for instance, uh, you uh, understand that despite it might uh, consider that the pandemic itself was the worst nightmare of the Crusaders, Aswa Kawabi Salibi, in fact, um, it still endorses uh, the, uh, the dominant approach or the, uh, the approach which focuses also on the uh, added value of scientific discourse. Um, they, uh, so Daesh and uh, Al-Qaeda in the peninsula, uh, issued guideline, guidelines that stress the necessity, for instance, to wash hands and maintain social distance. Uh, they also considered that due to the pandemic in, in Europe, um, uh, fighters should not uh, move from there or go there, which was uh, rather telling of, uh, of a kind of uh, relegation, again, of uh, what could be seen as a, a strictly uh, religious uh, discourse. Uh, an, an angle which was, uh, which was developed by a number of uh, uh, so-called uh, jihadi uh, groups um, for uh, critique or for radical critique has been uh, the closure of, uh, of mosques. Um, and so there, they didn't abide by the rules. But well, what's interesting is that it was uh, uh, a discourse which, which was mainly pushed forward by actors external to uh, the peninsula. Um, the, 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 the man which, uh, which appears here on the, on the, on the PowerPoint, Abdullah uh, Al-Muhaysani, is, um, is a Saudi cleric, and yet he's, uh, he's uh, based in, in Syria. And this is probably what allowed what allowed him to uh, uh, publish such uh, such harsh um, critiques of the decisions which were taken by uh, by his uh, his own uh, government. He stated that uh, that uh, uh, the closure of mosques were were a mistake, and in a way they were uh, symptomatic of um, what he describes as, as a materialistic interpretation of the reasons behind uh, the the spread of the pandemic. And he also stated that, for instance, Islamic jurisprudence had enough safeguards to actually um, uh, prevent people who are sick from going to, uh, to the mosque. And he used an example, uh, which is rather famous in, uh, in Islamic jurisprudence, uh, regarding um, people who eat garlic or, or onion and who are not uh, uh, allowed to enter, uh, to enter mosques because of this, uh, because of this, uh, this reason. Uh, the, the third um, uh, type of discourse, the third ideal type, is, uh, is probably one that, which is rather, uh, rather intermediate, um, which um, shows that while a certain number of actors who are within the peninsula and who, uh, who, have, uh, uh, who represent a number of institutions actually endorsed 
um, uh, public discourses uh, which were health oriented and which uh, generated a number of uh, of uh, uh, closure of institutions or uh, or other uh, phenomena. Um, there ease when it came to uh, their own relegation. And this um, has been uh, manifest, I think, in the case of the, of the Grand Mufti of, uh, of Oman, so uh, Ahmed al-Khalili, whom you see on the, on the, on the, on the left, who uh, published a, 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 a video in, uh, in March, um, who uh, 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 basically focused on uh, matters of uh, pure morality and who gave a religious interpretation of, uh, of what he calls so-called virus, which in a way contradicted most of the positions which were held by, uh, by the government. Um, and what's interesting is that at, at, at the beginning of this video, um, uh, he, while he's a governmental figure and he's a, he's a very prominent figure, he stated that, uh, that there had been a recording which was meant to be aired on television of his, uh, of his statements, but which, uh, which never really uh, was uh, 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 broadcast. So he claims that there had been a kind of, uh, kind of censorship. And this uh, generated a lot of uh, debate within, uh, within Omani society and, uh, and on the, on the uh, social media. Um, but what's interesting is that his, his own position um, uh, appeared as, as rather uh, marginal. When you look at the number of uh, views of his own video, it's, it's, it's rather low, 90,000 views. And if you compare it to, uh, to, the, uh, to the kind of, uh, of debate which emerged on social media because of, his, uh, because of his statements, I consider it to be uh, uh, indicative of a kind of, uh, of marginality, which is, uh, which is rather, um, rather telling. Um, another uh, uh, quite, quite interesting figure is uh, um, uh, Tarek al suwaidan So Tarek al suwaidan is a very prominent uh, figure in, uh, in Kuwait, um, which is uh, um, at the crossroads of personal development and, uh, and religious uh, discourse. Um, and so he published a, a, a video which you see, Kef Nata Amal Ma Azmat al Corona. Um, in which he uh, he states that he he acknowledges that he's not a, he's not a specialist of uh, of pandemics or of uh, pand of uh, corona. So there he uh, he says that uh, as a um, and yet as a, as a as a cleric, as a, someone who uh, values uh, religion, he must uh, develop a discourse. And what's uh, what's rather interesting is that uh, over the course of the of the um, uh, the video. He, uh, he mainly focuses on the effects of the pandemic on the economy, and much less actually on, on issues which are linked to morality or understanding why the, uh, why the, the, the pandemic has, uh, has uh, um, emerged or what can Muslims actually do to, uh, to actually uh, um, uh, lower its, uh, its impact. These, uh, these examples uh, regarding a kind of unease when it comes to the, to the kind of relegation um, can be put in, uh, in perspective with uh, another sequence which, uh, which followed uh, the, the massive um, support which uh, occurred, uh, I would say, during, uh, during the spring and uh, during most of the summer. Um, and, and this is uh, the sequence uh, related to uh, the calls to boycott French products. I think there, 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 is a, there probably is a kind of a trade-off which, uh, which occurred at the time. Uh, and this, is, uh, this has been the case, I would say, in Kuwait, but it's also been more or less uh, the case in, uh, in Oman, uh, where you had uh, a kind of license which was given to a number of, uh, of uh, religious authorities, which had largely abided by the rules uh, during, the, uh, during the, the pandemic, and which were given a, a kind of... Uh, of uh, allowance to uh, develop uh, discourses which uh, clashed with the positions of, uh, of the government. And I think that uh, this probably was, uh, was the case uh, uh, when it came to, uh, to the boycott of, uh, of French, uh, French products. Um, such, such has been uh, uh, the interpretation which was given uh, recently by, uh, by a famous uh, uh, Omani, Omani journalist who said that uh, in a way the voices 
uh, when it came to uh, either the pandemic or uh, the issue of the boycott of French products uh, were to be uh, to be heard. They needed to be uh, uh, to be maintained and preserved because uh, otherwise um, it would uh, would uh, would generate some kind of frustration within uh, within the general uh, the general public. I will uh, conclude now by just uh, just uh, uh, stating that uh, uh, this this moment of the pandemic, this last year, I think is is rather telling of uh, of a number of uh, very profound uh, uh, dynamics, and uh, and one of them is probably the uh, the kind of uh, secularization or uh, the kind of apoliticism also of a number of um, of institutions, which up to uh, recently had the upper say when it came to a number of, uh, of, uh, of issues. Um, what's interesting is that uh, the kind of uh, secularization here uh, is channeled through uh, what uh, Frédéric uh, often calls biopolitics here. Um, and yet, um, and, and this probably contradicts what I've been, uh, been saying by trying to sketch uh, the, the, the main, uh, the main uh, um, uh, dynamics here, and yet uh, we must never, never forget that there are tremendous differences when it comes to one, uh, one country, uh, uh, when it comes to the, the different, uh, different cases. And I think this is probably the reason why it's, uh, it's very important to actually uh, uh, see and understand how uh, the, case, the Yemeni case study, which will be presented by Abdel Salam, uh, uh, actually sheds light on the different uh, ideal types which I, uh, which I uh, uh, presented here. And maybe also contradicts them uh, by uh, having a different, a different perspective. Thank you very much. Thank you, Laurent. Um, just after you stop sharing your screen, we uh, will be hearing Abdel Salam. Excellent. So. Uh, Uh, Dr. Abdesalam al Rubaidi, you can now speak. Thank you, Laurent. Uh, yes, thank you very much, uh, uh, Frederick. Thank you very much, Philippe. And uh, I would like to thank my dear friend, uh, Laurent. And I'm really happy that we are uh, uh, sharing uh, today uh, the lecture in this seminar. Uh, so, um, Loro uh, had uh, has uh, spoken about uh, the he has given uh, the map about the discourses in the Arab Peninsula, and Yemen is not far away from these uh, discourses. Is it uh, Yemen is part of this? But uh, there are some uh, local features uh, that we can speak about. Uh, that the Yemeni religious and political landscape uh, uh, has. Uh, so uh, in Yemen, we have two we have had two uh, dominant uh, discourses. Uh, one um, uh, is the is about the question of whether the 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 health uh, uh, care system in Yemen would be able to confront this uh, pandemic and whether the state which is divided between the south and the north and also uh, part, uh, parts of the, of the state are in, uh, in Marib, uh, whether this uh, divided state would be able to, to do something for the people. Uh, that was the question at the beginning of two, uh, 2020. Uh, but there was also another um, uh, dominant uh, discourse, which is the religious discourse. The Yemeni society uh, sometimes is described as a religious society. Uh, so um, the, um, the, the religious leaders, sheikhs, muftis, they have contributed to the discussion. Um, and they spoke about um, the ritual, uh, ritualistic side aspect, aspects during this pandemic, and also about the causes and about the mess uh, messianic uh, reasons uh, for, for the pandemic. According to the Islamic uh, jurisprudence, uh, COVID-19 can be framed as a nazila, 
والنازلة هي الحدث which is a novel case or something that emerged suddenly and that affect Muslim individuals or, uh, or Muslim nations. And uh, this nazila uh, requires um, a fatwa or a legal opinion by the Muslim jurist. Uh, and, but not only by the Muslim jurist, but also by the specialist uh, in that field. And in this context, we are talking about the epidemiologist and the physicians. Uh, however, uh, this tradition was not um, followed by the religious uh, leaders in the Arab world. Uh, we have seen many people, many muftis, sheikhs, they, um, they have been giving their opinions without consulting uh, the specialist. Uh, for example, there are some funny cases. Ali Juma, the Grand Mufti of Egypt, he links uh, this pandemic to uh, the 5G wireless technology. Uh, following some conspiracy theories, even in the West. Um, in Saudi Arabia, uh, this um, uh, presidency of the affairs of the two holy mosques asked people uh, to drink uh, Zamzam water. Uh, but there are some uh, cases where some of the uh, religious leaders so, um, have um, uh, talked about uh, uh, the need for a new uh, hermeneutics, a new interpretation of the of the Quran. Khalid al Yundi is one of these people in uh, in Egypt. Uh, uh, to confine my uh, uh, my talk here to Yemen, uh, I would like to uh, to say that Yemen was not. Um, the debate was not far away from, from these people are talking about um, these uh, conspiracy theories, about um, uh, the, the legality of closing uh, uh, the closure of the Holy Mosque in Saudi Arabia. Uh, but what is um, particular in the Yemeni case is the politicization uh, of uh, the COVID-19 whether in, um, especially in the North, uh, because of this exceptional situation where uh, the Houthis, the de facto uh, government is in war with the Arab coalition led by Saudi Arabia and with the international uh, government. So at the beginning, uh, the government of the Houthis denied uh, any um, spread of COVID-19 in the, in the regions of Yemen. They said that we do not have this because Yemen is closed. Uh, and I remember that uh, Nawal al makhafi uh, did a documentary film for BBC, and she showed how the, gov how the authorities in Sana'a were um, uh, very um, uh, um, resistant to, to tell uh, about what is going on. And um, uh, the, the, the Minister of Health, Taha uh, Al-Mutawakkil, was saying we, we are um, taking the measures, everything is under control, and we do not have uh, this COVID-19. But at the end of this year, well, maybe in August, he said that the medicine of, uh, of COVID-19 will come from Yemen. That is after he, he realized that Yemen uh, has no... Uh, um, uh, many cases uh, of COVID-19. So uh, we have to, um, uh, as uh, Laurent talked uh, about uh, these kind of discourses in Yemen, we have two discourses. One I, I, I call the plain religious discourse, uh, which is taken from the text, from the scriptures. Uh, for example, Habib Abu Bakr al-Mashhur, uh, he is um, a Sufi religious figure who lives in Aden and uh, who leads uh, al Idarus Mosque. Uh, uh, he said that uh, the COVID-19 is one of the signs of the Day of Judgment. And um, it is uh, coming in, the, in the, this period of human deterioration, al Gutha. And according to him, uh, the, the three pillars of religion, uh, according to, to the Islamic scriptures, are not three, they are four. Uh, and he uh, depended on a hadith. Uh, 
that is Iman, uh, Islam, Iman, and Ihsan. Uh, this is what everybody say. We have three, Islam, Iman, and Ihsan, but according to Habib Abu Bakr, uh, he said, and alamat yawm al qiyamah, the signs of the day of judgments, and we have to believe in them. And he, during the last 30 years, he have been publishing books about this apocalyptic um, uh, predictions. Uh, so uh, COVID-19, according to him, also is a sign how the West and uh, some other countries um, are um, uh, making these troubles to humanity and how God will uh, apport these plans that are played by, by some wicked people, whether in the East or, or in the West, according to, to, to him. So he had a very famous uh, um, uh, um, a video um, where he talks about uh, uh, this uh, and he's denying, he's not talking about any scientific issues. Um, uh, and uh, he said uh, that uh, uh, God will, will, will help us in, uh, in, in, uh, in confronting uh, this, um, uh, this uh, virus. Also, Sheikh Muhammad Al uh, Abdul Majid Al Zindani. He is of Muslim Brotherhood background. He is from the Salafi uh, trend inside the Yemeni Muslim Brotherhood. Uh, he said that he has a medicine for. He has a medicine for for this. But until now, we did not see this uh, medicine. And he said that he derived this medicine from uh, the prophetic tradition from the Al-Tabb al-Nabawi, the medical um, um, of Prophet, uh, the medical tradition of Prophet Muhammad. And his um, sister, she is a, a sheikh, also sheikha, uh, Aisha. She said that um, uh, coronavirus is a shaitan and uh, it enters into human beings' body. Uh, and she is uh, depending on some hadiths. So many of the Yemeni activists and social media uh, users criticize Sheikh Muhammad and his sister. And uh, they say they are uh, following their fathers in claiming that they have medicines for such um, big diseases, but they do not have. For example, Ali Al-Hajuri, he is an actor, uh, a comedian actor. Uh, he had series of videos uh, criticizing a Zandani family, uh, and uh, he's labeling uh, his uh, videos as a battle for raising awareness. He himself was uh, one day uh, part in an Islah party. He was a preacher, but now he, he, he believes in, um, uh, in the value of science, and um, also he is, the, he is uh, propagating uh, a moderate uh, Islamic, uh, uh, Islamic discourse. So he also uh, mocks Muhammad Nasr al-Hazmi, Sheikh Muhammad Nasr al-Hazmi, who said that God has banished uh, China because they, um, they are uh, oppressing Muslims uh, there in, in, in China. Uh, Ali Al-Hajuri said, this uh, comedian actor, uh, this is a sheer ignorance of Al-Hazmi to say this. Um, uh, coronavirus is a catastrophe and knows no race and no religion and that all people must work in favor of humanity instead of this malicious joy. So from this uh, uh, plain religious uh, uh, framing of the of of the virus that depends on some literally on on some verses from the Quran that God punished some nations because they they had sins as Laurent said uh, they did not believe in him so uh, there are some uh, verses on some hadiths about this but uh, whether they are uh, they apply to the cases we have or not that was uh, part of the, the controversy. So um, we have another um, religious discourse, uh, rationalized and politicized. Uh, 
uh, one of the religious figures uh, who um, his origins are from Yemen, Habib Ali Zayl al-Abidin al-Jifri. He lives now uh, between Egypt and the United Arab Emirates. He is supporting uh, the policies um, somehow of uh, United Arab Emirates and Egypt. So he is not on the line of Muslim brothers in Egypt. So um, in one of his lectures, uh, he is criticizing those who say that this is a punishment of God against uh, China. That was at the beginning uh, of the pandemic. al um said that this criticism of China, this propaganda is China, reminds us of what happened in 1980s when the United States, Saudi Arabia, and other countries um, um, the Salafis were uh, encouraging people to go to Afghanistan to fight the uh, communist Soviet Union. And he said, um, uh, China is oppressing not only Muslims, but non-Muslims. God uh, spoke about uh, punishing some nations with, this, with, the, with natural catastrophes, but we cannot say that what is going on now is uh, of this uh, of this kind of of uh, of godly uh, punishment. So Al, -Al Gifri, um, he is um, uh, he t talks also in another uh, other videos about how to to deal with this uh, COVID 90s and he used some of the hadiths by Prophet Muhammad. So uh, uh, as everybody can take from the tradition. So al Gifri talk, selected one hadith that says, stay at your home if there is a plague, don't go outside, be patient. If you die, then you have the, uh, uh, the, um, the award of being martyr, of being martyr. Uh, this is what he, what he said. And he was um, asking people to use, um, 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 how to say to be careful uh, and to to abide by the uh, the instructions of the government in social distances. Um, away from Al Jifri, uh, we go back to Sanaa to the Houthi uh, uh, figures who are mostly religious, who are well versed in in Zaidi uh, jurisprudence. Uh, starting from Abdul Malik Al Houthi to the Minister of uh, Media, Minister of Information, Taifullah Shami, to the Minister of uh, Health, Tahir Mutawakkil, who is a preacher in one of the mosques of Sana'a, and uh, a physician, and the Minister of uh, of Health. So uh, Abdul Malik Al Houthi, the leader of the of the group, said that closing uh, the closure of the Holy Mosque in Saudi Arabia. Uh, is haram, is uh, forbidden, and it is uh, against uh, uh, the, um, the practices of Muslims for uh, more than a thousand years. We have had in history uh, pandemics, plagues, but people uh, did not, uh, Muslims did not close the, the, holy, uh, the, holy, um, the holy mosque, and they did not uh, forbidden uh, uh, the Muslims from coming to Mecca uh, during Hajj. And the uh, Houthi thinks that uh, the Saud house are not the eligible people, the qualified people to be in custody of the mosque of, uh, of, of Mecca. And this is part of his, um, of his uh, 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 discourse during the war. Uh, it's not the first time that he said that the Saud family um, the Saud uh, Al Saud family are not the ones who are who who, who should be um, the, in the custody of the of the Holy Mosque. Uh, he said that in different occasions. Dhaifullah uh, Shami he said that it is the USA using biological uh, infectious agent to fight its economic and ideological enemies, namely China and Iran. Um, also Taha al um, sometimes he asked people to abide by the instructions to, uh, of social distances, uh, cleaning um, their hands um, um, and buying this. Um, um, uh, uh, so he, he, in part of his discourse, he, uh, he was with this, uh, instructions, but also he's saying that God is um, keeping Yemen, especially Yemen, 
because there are people who, who are real believers and who are maintaining uh, the tradition of Islam. And that's why Yemen is uh, kept from this uh, pandemic. And he said that the US is behind uh, the spread of this, uh, uh, of this uh, virus. Um, like what the United States did during the, in 2001, September 11, he said that the US can destroy every nation, even its own nation. So uh, it is not surprising that there are people in America dying because of this pandemic. Uh, Akram al he is a traditionalist, uh, Zaidi Faqih and the preacher judge in the Grand Mosque of Sana'a. He said that God himself is punishing the West because they closed, they stopped our airports. Uh, God stopped um, their airports and they uh, also uh, had this selections of, 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 uh, on us and God uh, um, uh, um, on, on our children and women and God hit their economy and imposed on them uh, guarantee. So these statements reflect the ideological and political polarization uh, at the local level in its connection to regional and international levels. The war in Yemen and the political climate in the whole region have impacted the very structural religious discourses on this issue. So uh, coronavirus and the ways of confronting it in these discourses are not addressed in isolation of the existential questions of the main actors in Yemeni political and religious uh, landscape. Uh, there are people who believe that in this contradiction of the religious uh, discourses about this pandemic is a chance for an awakening force for the consciousness of those who still take the opinions of clerics on scientific issues seriously. Uh, however, given that Yemen is still, um, uh, now Yemen is, is closed, uh, so some people believe that it is because we do not have um, now um, active airports that we do not have many cases. Uh, according to the last uh, statistics, we have 2,000 people who did, but I, as I said at the beginning, uh, there has been no uh, transparency regarding uh, this uh, issue. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much to you. Um, I will be as um, kind of always taking the advantage that is given to me as um, hosting the presentation to ask you both uh, a question about divine punishment. It's a point that was very interesting in uh, Abdus Sanam's talk. What is kind of surprising for me is the semi-absence of this important theme of pandemic seen as divine punishment in the mainstream discourses um, about God's poetic justice. It is... Um, because this is what was heard after the earthquake in Cairo in 1992. This is also what was heard after the tsunami in 2004. And if when we come back in history and read accounts of the, of the plague pandemics in the 14th century, and if you read the pages that Ibn Taghribardi uh, was writing about the pandemics in the Middle Ages, um, it was about assigning the fault. What had we as Muslim done wrong so that we deserve what God is punishing us with? Um, if this discourse is marginalized, as I understand, even in Yemen, has it been heard in the general public? Is it something that you have read about, heard about people perceiving the pandemic as poetic justice, as divine punishment, not against the Chinese or the Americans or the Europeans, but against us as Muslims, people wondering what did we do wrong to deserve what is 
happening to humanity as a whole and us in particular. Yeah, thank you, uh, thank you, Frederic. I think it's uh, it's uh, it's quite uh, quite fascinating to see that it has not not been uh, not been central. Um, it probably has been uh, has been implicit in a number of, uh, of statements, and I think that uh, uh, the example that uh, that I took of the of the uh, Omani Mufti uh, actually uh, uh, having a focus on on issues of uh, of uh, public morality. Uh, and then so on uh, shows that it was uh, an implicit stance, uh, meaning that if you wanted to uh, to get away from uh, from this uh, this pandemic, of course you needed to abide by uh, by the by the, the the rules focusing on 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 health, but you also uh, had to be a better Muslim. But what uh, what probably justifies uh, uh, the idea that it has not been central is that uh, all in all, it did not start uh, and did not uh, primarily uh, touch um, Muslim populations. Uh, since it started, um, well, in China and then um, touched uh, mainly uh, European and uh, North American uh, uh, countries, I think this generated a kind of, uh, of stance or, uh, or an uh, an appreciation which is uh, which is very different. It's uh, it's, quite, it's rather telling that uh, um, in March uh, when uh, when Daesh publishes its own uh, its own uh, commentary on uh, on the pandemic, uh, it describes it as the as the worst nightmare of the of the Crusaders, uh, which means that at the time uh, they're uh, implying that it will not uh, concern uh, uh, Muslim uh, dominated uh, societies, so that they are in a way protected from it. Uh, which uh, might have been uh, seen uh, in retrospect as, as a rather clumsy move when uh, when the pandemic has in effect touched uh, and concerned all the all societies but it probably explains why uh, there was uh, a, a feeling which went beyond i think uh, religious actors it was also present i think in uh, in, the, in the discourse of uh, of the states in uh, of the at least the, the monarchies uh, uh, showing that they were also efficient in their own uh, dealing of the uh, with uh, with the pandemic, at least much more efficient than America or uh, or Europe. Uh, China was probably a different uh, a different uh, different thing, but this was present in society and um, being present in society at large, uh, uh, it was obviously also something which which structured uh, a religious uh, discourse. Thank you. Um... Uh, Salah Tunse is still with us, I think, so I am, uh, you can open your mic and you can uh, ask your question directly if you are here with us, Sara. Yes, uh, uh, can you hear okay. me? Yes, we can hear you, yes. Uh, thank you so much for this panel, I really appreciate it. Um, I have two main questions. Um, the first is about the... Um, the funerals or the the the, the process the proce procedures of the death and the, the burial and salat al ganeza so funerary prayers and if there was a special discourse on death especially and uh, martyrdom with regards to the virus thank you so much so uh Either Abd Salam or Laurent, uh, any answer uh, on the discourses concerning uh, a death in uh, uh, Yes, uh, there has been um, a debate about this among lay Muslims and clergy men, uh, men um, of not only in the Arab world but uh, also in uh, uh, in the West. Um, in Yemen, for example, people were asking whether um, can we uh, consider these people as martyrs or not, because uh, the Muslim um, tradition uh, in, in Islamic jurisprudence, there is a distinction between shaheed al-dunya wa shaheed al-akhira wa shaheed al-dunya wa al-akhira. There is th three tribes of martyrs. Mm -hmm. um, so there are people, for example, those who are burned or, or did under um, any uh, deconstruction or in the sea, if they are drawn, they are considered to be uh, martyrs, but not here in the hereafter. 
في الآخرة. Uh, so we deal with them during the uh, uh, the um, burial uh, as anyone else. Uh, so this is what uh, some of uh, the Yemeni uh, scholars, religious scholars, say about uh, uh, the pandemic. We have to uh, uh, to wash them even by some uh, um, some tools. Uh, or to have tayammum, which is to put uh, um, a mud to wrap um, one uh, who has um, uh, from the hospital, uh, who is well uh, equipped, uh, well protected, can do this, and then we bury them. So these are uh, some of the discussions uh, that people had uh, about this. I am sure that something happened also uh, in France uh, itself regarding this issue. Um. Abbas, I think you wanted to uh, add something or ask uh, another question which is linked to martyrdom. Do you want? Yes, thank you. Uh, good evening and thank you, uh, Laurent uh, Abdesalam, for your, 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 your talk. Yes, I wanted also to ask the same question regarding the status of uh, Marche. So, um, you answered uh, uh, Abdel Salam, but I, uh, I'm sure they are uh, re referring to 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 a medieval text. No, uh, uh, can you uh, do you uh, identify some uh, some um, uh, some discussions about uh, this status? Are all uh, men of religion are uh, uh, agree with the with 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 this uh, status or not? Uh, uh, as I said before, the uh, in jurisprudence, uh, Islamic jurisprudence, there is a distinction between shaheed al dunya wal akhira, the one who is killed in a battle against uh, disbelievers. And uh, this one, we do not, uh, we do not wash him or her uh, we uh, we do not uh, put coffin on him or her. We just um, uh, bury him or her. Um, this is for these people who uh, fight against non-Muslims in a battle that uh, that protect the Muslim nation, according to the traditional Islamic jurisprudence. But. Uh, there are people who are considered to be shaheed. For example, the mother who, who, who is pregnant and died, uh, the one who is uh, drawn, uh, or the al-hadma, um, yeah, wal-gharqa, wal-harqa. These people are all considered to be martyrs, but not uh, in the, uh, they, they are not treated in this life as being uh, martyrs. And uh, we have this debate in Yemen, as, uh, as I said, and uh, the Mufti uh, of Tarim, um, one of the Muftis in Tarim, he said that we deal with them uh, according to the um, um, prestigious uh, imposed on us by the state. Uh, for We use uh, um, uh, some tools for, uh, for, for washing them. And uh, we have to be careful when when burying them. Uh, people are not uh, are not supposed to attend uh, during the funeral. Uh, so um, there has been a rationalization, and they have um, uh, some uh, framework of reference in the Islamic jurisprudence for this. Thank you. So they can, uh, uh, according to, to some to some muft, muftis, they are considered as martyrs. Uh, in the aftermath, not here. In, in the aftermath, of course, of course, yes, yeah. yes, yes. yes. Uh, in you, the afterlife, you. yes, yeah, afterlife. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. The next uh, question will be from uh, Marion Breton. Marion, you can now switch on your mic. Yes, hello, thank you, Frédéric, for the, giving me the possibility to talk. So, um, actually, I had a question for Laurent, but maybe also the Salam can answer. Um, so, you were talking about these three types of discourses, and I had the impression these were rather institu institutional or mainstream. And I was wondering how the people, you know, uh, embody, adopt, uh, or 
what are their attitudes uh, towards these uh, three types of discourses and what are the tendencies that the people have uh, uh, towards the whole situation uh, also according to the to the vaccine and also I had a small remark about the, the great Muftis video which is really interesting in Oman um, I have the impression that maybe the views were so few uh, maybe because the people forward such things on the social media most of the time you know and they might also you know uh, cut the original video and share pieces only so Maybe that's why they don't go to the source and which could be the reason why the, the views are uh, few. Thank you. Well, thank you. Um, regarding your last comment, I, I agree. Uh, I mean, it might have been um, a cut. Uh, now you had segments which were uh, much more uh, 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 widely, widely seen than, uh, than uh, what, what is suggested by, uh, by YouTube. Um, and your, your question uh, regarding the attitude of the general public when it comes to, uh, to either of these, uh, these three uh, um, stances, I would say it's quite, it's quite difficult to actually understand what is the, the, the dominant view and what lay, uh, lay Omanis or lay Saudis uh, think about uh, what, is, uh, what is happening. What is rather telling is that uh, uh, the, uh, the field or the, 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 the dominant religious uh, field is now uh, uh, strictly controlled by, uh, by Islam. Um, it is uh, obviously very difficult to have counter discourses which, uh, which emerge. Uh, uh, apart from, uh, and there, the, the, there might be a, a kind of a, a counter example, which would be Kuwait, but I'm not, uh, I haven't been following it strictly. But I hear that there, there, there has been uh, uh, discourses uh, within, uh, within uh, uh, the Kuwaiti Parliament, which uh, which highlighted some kind of uh, of politicization um, similar to what uh, what unfolded in uh, in Yemen. Uh, I, I I saw uh, comments being made by uh, by uh, MPs close to the Muslim Brotherhood, which which actually stigmatized uh, uh, Egypt, for, but for uh, using the COVID. Um, as a way to actually stigmatize Egypt and the Sisi regime uh, because of what it's been doing to the, to the, to the uh, Muslim Brotherhood rather than just for, uh, for any kind of random reason. So there, uh, uh, this, uh, this shows that there is, uh, is some kind of uh, space which, uh, which exists. Regarding uh, vaccines, um, uh, one of the only uh, uh, comments which, uh, which I saw was uh, linked to, to the fact that uh, vaccines uh, themselves were using uh, gelatin um, and uh, and this was uh, was the object of a uh, different uh, different comment, uh, but it was uh, uh, in a way whitewashed by uh, by the by the different uh, fatawa which were which were published by the by the authorities. So I don't see any kind of a, of a very uh, uh, systematic resistance to uh, to uh, to the vaccines and to the the, the policy which the, the different uh, countries have been have been following. And there, uh, you might, um, if you wanted to dig, and if I wanted to dig a bit, uh, a bit deeper uh, into this uh, this issue, I think that there clearly is a kind of temporality which uh, which has changed, and this is something which uh, which uh, uh, Frederic had, uh, had already highlighted. Um, uh, the, the the main discourse happened uh, uh, during the first phase of the of the, of the pandemic, and then quite clearly. Uh, over the last months, there has been a sense that, uh, that we were, uh, or that societies in the region were sort of uh, uh, getting out of this, uh, this long tunnel. And so uh, all the debates, which, uh, which Abdel Salam also mentioned, obviously happened in the, in the first, uh, first few weeks or first three months. Thank you very much. The uh, next question uh, will be from Elise Tonkwang. Elise, you can now open your mic. Um, thanks a lot. I don't know if I managed to do it. Um, yes, you are connected, Elise. Uh, um, we can hear you. Uh, oh, you can hear me. Uh, thank you. So, so, uh, sorry. Uh, thanks a lot for your two presentations. Uh, I was interested uh, more uh, generally and in details in the relationship between the 
what I, what I call the national task force that some uh, countries uh, set up to, to fight COVID and uh, those institutional uh, religious institutions and all religious uh, uh, figures. Uh, I was wondering if there were some explicit collaborations between the two. Um, so I don't know if some, if every country set up such a task force. I, I mostly studied the one in Jordan, the epidemiological committee, but I guess uh, I suppose that everyone did. So I was curious about knowing more about this. Thank you. So, I, I personally have not uh, not been uh, been following this uh, this kind of uh, collaboration. Uh, I I mostly understood that there was a there, there was this kind of uh, hierarchy which was uh, which was established with uh, with science being pushed forward and and religion uh, in a way relegated, which is uh, what I what I see as probably the most uh, uh, telling uh, mm. phenomenon currently. But maybe Abdel Salam has other uh, other perspective. Uh. Uh, there, there has been a case um, uh, in Yemen that is a uh, Tarim uh, directorate. It is a town in East Yemen and it is um, one of the Shafi'i centers um, in the world. Um, uh, so um, Habib Omar bin Hafid, he is a mufti in, in Tarim, not the, the, the main mufti of Tarim. His brother is the main mufti of Tarim. He was saying, you, people terrifying us. And he means the government with uh, with this COVID nineteen, God will protect us, and uh, and he was um, against um, uh, terrifying people with this, and he said um, uh, we do not need uh, to be afraid of this. Uh, but unfortunately, on April, uh, his brother, the Grand Mufti of Tarim, died because of uh, COVID nineteen. Uh, with some other people who were attending in one of the big mosques in in Tarim, and um, uh, the general director of the of this town uh, was against uh, the move to against uh, Habib Omar bin Hafid. He said, uh, before this death of of the Grand Mufti, uh, we uh, we ask people not to attend to the mosques mosques not because we are against the mosques. Not we, we are against the Sufis who have this um, celebrations, uh, the Mawalid, uh, extra. We are, uh, so there was uh, this um, discourse of the state by Khaled um, Huwadi, who is the general director of Tarim, and the religious uh, discourse by Omar bin Hafid. Uh, so um, that was at the beginning, but after that, when Hafid himself he became um, uh, rash, uh, rational in his in his discourse. He's saying people should take care and should uh, supplicate God, should uh, follow the hygienic um, uh, instructions uh, in order to protect themselves, and God will protect us. This is what exactly what he said. Mm. So there was uh, some kind of uh, clash between the discourse of the the, gov the government and the religious mm. people. But in Sana'a, they collaborate with each other because the people who are religious are are um, uh, ruling uh, North mm. Yemen, uh, namely the Houthis. Mm. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Uh, Sylvia Serrano from uh, Sorbonne Abu Dhabi, you can now open your mic. Okay, thank you very much for this very interesting presentation. I have a, a two a, a small question. About two. One is more an element of, let's say, discussion than really a question. I was very interested by the, the what was what said by uh, Laurent Smith uh, about the relegation of the religion discourse. So, and I was just wondering how um, to interpret this uh, relegation, whether it means that um, in the context of the crisis or the crisis, let's say, highlights some uh, um, evolution, the, the development that were already here. Uh, and that is also to follow up with the question, I think that um, Marion Manon asked the question before, it's difficult to understand what is the feeling inside the society. I understand that, but nevertheless, uh, whether we can, um, this relegation is, uh, can be interpreted as um, just um, um, shedding some light of a development and of a secularization of society, uh, or uh, just um, um, the crisis gives the possibility for the state at home, a uh, state institution to, uh, to have a stricter control of a religious institution. So that is my first question. 
And related to this question of secularization in, in the presentation made by Laurent, there was, I, I had the feeling perhaps uh, I'm not uh, correct and uh, please uh, tell me if, uh, if I'm wrong about that. I had the feeling that uh, you mentioned at the same time secularization and depolitization. And I had the feeling uh, in a sense that it would be rather the, the opposite if we, we are in a sec in society that are much more secular, secularized that, uh, uh, that, we can, that we can pick. That means that um, uh, the, the room for religion discourse is politization. So I would not uh, make an opposition between secularization and, uh, and politization, but rather uh, both uh, uh, are coming together, I would say. So that's uh, my first uh, set of uh, questions. And the second one is a very small question regarding what you mentioned about um, uh, the vaccine and about the arguments against the vaccine and about the fact that uh, the Council of Fatwa, I think, I can't remember the, the, the accurate name, um, well, washed up any question regarding uh, the, um, uh, uh, the conformity of the vaccine and uh, decided that uh, it is uh, halal. But nevertheless, I, I, I am very interested about the discourse and the argument. Uh, um, as um, you mentioned that um, the, the only um, question discussion was about gelatin. And I wonder if the argument was, okay, there is pork gelatin, but uh, it's not a problem. Or yes, there was pork gelatin. It is a problem in general, but in this specific case, it is not a problem because there's something more important or any kind of other argument to, um, to, have, um, to have the vaccine um, considered as a halal. Thank you. These are, are, are very broad questions. Let me just, uh, just state that um, basically, you, we have a lot of uh, things, you know, unraveling uh, uh, right in front of the, our eyes, uh, over, and, and this has been the case uh, over the over the last year, much more probably than uh, than before. Um, so much of it is is just food for thought, and I, I'd be uh, very uh, uh, um, cautious uh, when it comes to the different, uh, uh, you know, the labeling the different uh, uh, the different different hypotheses that uh, that are uh, that are unfolding. I think that that it might. Uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, deliver a profound change um, uh, when it comes to the, the, the this kind of secularization which is uh, which is happening, and I think this uh, this probably uh, uh, could be traced back even before the pandemic. Um, a new kind of uh, of approach to approach to religion, um, but again, it's it's very difficult to actually uh, understand what people uh, uh, make of it. Uh, are they really buying what uh, what the governments are are pushing forward, uh, or is it something which is uh, which uh, uh, can trigger uh, a number of uh, of reactions in the, in the long term, where where people will uh, will uh, uh, value uh, much more uh, the religious discourse, which is uh, which they deem uh, to be uh, to be important. Uh, so I, I'm, I'm not actually confident to, to enough to, 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 to uh, consider what will happen in the in the um, in the long run. Uh, regarding the the, the gelatin uh, issue, um, the argument which was made was that uh, since it was not eaten, it was uh, was, uh, was, uh, was something which was uh, not uh, not an issue in uh, in itself. Um, I, I I don't know what to make of it when it comes to uh, to debates which uh, which exist within uh, within the uh, within the ulama. Um, I did not see uh, any kind of a, a, a very prominent uh, debate emerging, and one of the reasons might be also because uh, because things are happening so uh, so fast. So we might need to, uh, to 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 wait just a few uh, few months more uh, to see if there's any any kind of reaction. But uh, but I still think that. Uh, but over the last uh, last uh, year or so, the relegation of uh, public discourse has been something which has been uh, very uh, very manifest. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you, Laurent. Uh, I think there will be a last question by Philippe Petria, and then we uh, will have to let our speakers rest. I thank you, Frederick, for giving me this privilege to ask uh, the last question of our seminar. It's just a broad question, as the one mentioned by Sylvia and Laurent. To what extent is um, the stance of the actors you mentioned, namely Paul, 
related to the official position. I mean, it seems that there is a kind of gap between people official, official with um, the function of the government or related to government movement or people working for ministry is not a function. Actually, describing the COVID as um, not as an asylum, but uh, something that can be dealt with, and that they have to support uh, the government's efforts, and a gap between them and another group of people, which are actually opponents of people, uh, I mean, contradicting or criticizing the government, criticizing the authority, the not of Yemen. So I, I just would like to know if it was just not depending on their position. Uh, toward uh, the power or toward the state. So to what extent is the position uh, or this their stance toward the COVID related to their position toward uh, the power? It's a, it's a difficult uh, difficult question to actually, you, you're in a way asking if they were convinced or uh, by, uh, by what they were saying. Uh, uh, when it came to the pandemic, I, I, I still think that uh, mm, what's rather telling is that uh, you know, counter discourses, first of all, they probably did not emerge because there was uh, no space for them. Uh, and this is something which is a uh, uh, characteristic, I would say, of, uh, of the uh, six, six monarchies, where it's, uh, it's quite evident that uh, there almost is no space for any kind of counter discourse, just because uh, even when it comes to, to uh, uh, the khutbah or uh, whatever, it's still very, it's now, it has now become very centralized, that there's surveillance, so, etc. Um, so this is probably the first, uh, the first reason. So no, no possibility to have a, to have a counter discourse. And then even when you add uh, what might be uh, uh, other types or what I call the, the, the second ideal type here, a, a kind of uh, allegedly radical critique um, of the uh, pandemic phase, be it because they criticize uh, uh, the, uh, the decision making of the government or because they consider that the pandemic itself is some kind of conspiracy, is that there is almost no uh, kind of uh, religious added value to it. Uh, you find that uh, probably uh, Trump supporters or, or, or certain supporters from the far right in, uh, in Europe would have the, the same kind of positions as as ones which were uh, defended by uh, by Islamists or by uh, Salafis, um, and what's what's rather telling of the, the this kind of uh, uh, um, alleged uh, counter discourse is that even for the most radical uh, actors, um, they ended up having some kind of uh, 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 pro science uh, discourse which popped up, and that's why I. I uh, I, I used even the, the, the issue of, uh, of Tarot Soidan, even though he's not, uh, he's not himself a radical, but, uh, but it was uh, rather telling to see that uh, he was uh, meant to, to sort of develop a kind of uh, religious discourse and he ended up focusing on the economy. The same goes with, uh, with, uh, with Daesh. I mean, they're, they're meant to focus on, uh, on uh, uh, the, the, the pandemic as, uh, as uh, um, focusing on the Crusaders, and yet, at the same time, they uh, they would have their uh, their own fighters to be cautious about it and not not travel because it's a, it's a dangerous time. Um, and so there's almost this kind of impossibility. Uh, uh, and I think that there probably is something very specific with uh, health matters with this, uh, this pandemic, not having this uh, the, the, this uh, space for any form of uh, 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 direct uh, religious based uh, uh, counter. Uh, Yes, I would like to say something about the question of Sylvia regarding secularization. Uh, when we talk about, uh, just to remind ourselves with some basics, that when we talk about secularization processes in the Arab or in the Muslim world, uh, we are in different contexts from Europe. Uh, I know that everybody know, know, uh, know uh, this, know but, this uh, but I think... Uh, that the state in the Arab world uh, emerged and developed in different way from the context uh, in Europe and in different uh, places in the world. The state, the modernist nation state uh, always co-opt the religious institutions in the Arab world. For example, in the United Arab Emirates nowadays, 
uh, the uh, the khatibs the the uh, the muftis they say what the what the government say and they try to rational uh, to justify um, uh, the decisions of the government um, uh, this is one thing uh, the other thing is that fatwa in islamic jurisprudence uh, is not binding when an individual uh, mufti says something it is a legal opinion a mere legal opinion as a lay muslim you can follow it and you cannot uh, you you just you can opt for for not following this uh, this mufti so a fatwa by definition uh, is an opinion uh, based on some evidence from the Quran, the Sunnah, or from the Qiyas, or the consensus ijma, uh, but you can have, if you have the tools of thinking, of uh, reading the scriptures, uh, your own one. So the government sometimes, or the, the, the state, they um, can have their own muftis who uh, can go uh, hand uh, with hand with the rationalization uh, uh, of the government itself. So, and the, the, the bureaucratic decisions of the, of the government. And if we have, for example, in Yemen, a strong state, then we can see that the state is imposing its decision uh, based on some religious uh, justifications. Thank you very much. I will uh, thank again uh, both Abdus Salam and Laurent for this fascinating talk and extremely enriching uh, session we had today. It was actually the first time we discussed uh, in detail uh, the religious discourse in the Arab world uh, facing the corona crisis. Uh, we will be meeting again next month and it should be from Cairo with uh, perhaps the last session for the Sokosma seminar, uh, which will be animated by Sidej. Uh, thank you everybody for this excellent session again.